Hello everyone and welcome to another Live at Five. I am your host, curator Kevin Atkinson with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. You may have noticed that it's been a while since we had a Live at Five over here on our Instagram page. We've moved most of them onto uh, Facebook and Wednesdays, but I thought it would be fun because today was a very big day here at Cranbrook uh, with the reinstallation of our hit cannon. And this is an object that I thought had been off of display for quite a while. Turns out it was taken off of display about four days before I got here in August of 2016. So today, this morning between 8 a.m. and about 10.45, uh, working with the Art Museum Registrar, Corey Gross, as well as Leslie Mayo, the Center's Registrar, and a really skilled and dedicated team from Cranbrook Facilities, we were able to reinstall the cannon. And those of you who have been around Cranbrook for a while may recognize it. It's back roughly in the same location. But if you haven't ever seen this cannon, which I had only seen it in pieces, it is really a tour de force. Um, now, I might should put a warning on the cannon uh, uh, live at five because it has some pretty weird themes. But before we get close and are looking in uh, detail at the cannon, I just want to tell us a little bit about its maker. Um, it was crafted by Cranbrook's third sculptor in residence, Julius Schmidt. Julius Schmidt was born in Stanford, Connecticut in 1923. He died uh, just four years ago in 2017. And he was trained uh, at Oklahoma A&M College in chemistry, geology, and metallurgy. And after his studies in uh, metals at the University of Oklahoma, Schmidt headed off to the U.S. Uh, Navy, where he served for 10 years as a um, naval gunner, an aerial gunner, in serving after World War II and then in Korea. He came to Cranbrook, or he may not have served in Korea. Um, he came to Cranbrook in 1951 as a BFA, a bachelor's or undergraduate student, and he earned his BFA in 1953, and then he earned his uh, MFA in 1955. He was studying under text um, uh, Schiewitz, who was a student of Carl Millis and was our, our uh, third sculpture in residence. Julia Schmidt was the fourth sculptor in residence. And uh, so Julia Schmidt was in the legacy of sort of figural sculpture. So he was, there was Carl Millis who educated uh, Schiewitz and then there was uh, Julia Schmitz below him. And, Schmidt is really interesting because he goes in a completely different direction from the sort of monumental bronzes of Carl Millis. And he takes sculpture at Cranbrook into iron. And he was really very interested in iron and only iron. And some of the students who were sculpture students at the time complained that all their head artist wanted to do was iron casting. And in order to do that, Julia Schmidt had to go to different tool and die companies around Detroit and have them donate metal equipment and a forge to create the Cranbrook Foundry in 1964. Schmidt only headed the department for four years. In that time, the metal foundry was built. It had six furnaces. They could cast up to a thousand pounds of bronze or iron. And for Julia Schmidt, having the students actually cast uh, these pieces in iron on the campus was a way of the artist connecting with the making of its objects. So instead of the artist making a piece and someone else casting it and producing it, he thought that the designer, the artist, the maker should take the work through the entire process. And that would give a more tactile experience connection to the material and a better understanding of the medium, which would lead to more imagination and better art. So what exactly are we looking at? It is a cannon and I have it a little bit tied up at the moment, but it does pivot on its base. 
The Canon itself dates to 1966. It was debuted at graduation 1966. Uh, and we have a wonderful picture of Julia Schmidt and some of his students standing about right there. Uh, if you don't recognize where we are, we're right in front of Cranbrook Art Museum. So uh, the Canon debuted in May of 66 right here or June of 66 in front of the art museum. It took another four years for the wheels and the uh, cradle of the crane to be made. And it has all different sort of creatures and features and allegories. Uh, the bronze cradle, it's a weird combination of bronze and iron. So iron cannon, iron wheels, bronze cradle. Uh, this was casted uh, cast by the students of the class of 1970 and 71. And there's this skull which is smoking a pipe and the skull is cracked. And I should have unharnessed uh, the cannon. Please don't do that if you come and visit it on the campus. Um, it will be secured permanently or semi-permanently soon. Uh, but the cannon, when it is lowered, it actually crushes the skull. And so I love that he has this sort of cracked head right where the cannon lands. Behind that is this uh, figure of a woman who has this sort of snake coming around her breast and then this harness. And we'll also see some of the students' names on the piece. So we see Mel is here. Um, down here it says Floyd was here. Uh-oh. Sorry about that technical difficulty. Um, so it says Floyd was here there. Uh, and then this is this female figure here is the Foundry Queen. So you'll see it says Foundry Queen. Uh, and then there's all sorts of other wonderful sort of texts that you can read, like taste, grace, and elegance. Um, as we move around, well, keep moving on the cradle. We saw that uh, he signs his piece, not only Julia Schmidt, but also Julia Schmidt is Cranbrook. And what's interesting about the date of writing Julia Schmidt is Cranbrook is that when this was cast in 1971, Julia Schmidt was very much not Cranbrook. Um, he was quite um, uh, dramatically relieved of his duties as sculptor in residence in 1968. And that's a story for another Live at Five for another day. But Julia Schmidt was relieved of his teaching responsibilities and left in quite a storm of multiple op-eds in Detroit newspapers, multiple rather slanderous declarations on all sides between the artist and Cranbrook leadership. I have my own opinions on the matter. If you read the archives today with a little bit of historical distance, um, it really seems much to do about nothing, uh, but Julia Schmidt was rather a persona non grata here on campus, which is why I find it so interesting that the cradle would say, Julia Schmidt is Cranbrook. I think it's a reflection of how loyal um, his students were to the artist, and they truly were loyal, those who weren't instigating his removal because he refused to teach them anything except for iron poor, but those students were a little bit more sheepish than the ones who wrote to the Detroit News that um, Glenn Paulson was causing the ruin of the academy. Now, as we move down, uh, we really, I mean, this piece is totally exquisite, um, if not a little bit uh, adult themed. So we have this figure in a sort of basketball uh, jersey and the legs coming back and then his hands coming back and grabbing his head. And out of the mouth of this anguished figure, there's sort of flames bursting up to the middle finger going up uh, 60 days and 60 nights. And then the middle finger going up uh, uh, into new places, new adventures. And then we look back and we can see this sort of anguished head that is sort of spitting out the hand and flames. It is a pretty weird piece of sculpture. Now, all throughout it are different words and phrases. Uh, and then the back of the cannon has this wonderful sort of flame sunburst. And at first the cannon was just in a wooden cradle before they made the, uh, the bronze cradle in the wheels. Unfortunately, the axle has seized and so the cannon no longer rolls. Uh, it has been fired a few times. It was fired in 1966 when it was finished. It was fired out of the sculpture department onto the Triton pools. And then once the wheels were put on, 
uh, in the late days of Zoltan Zepeshi's uh, presidency, it was rolled down Academy Way and they lit the fuse, hit the clacker, and nothing happened. But they were trying to shoot a cannonball through the front door of Saarinen House. Um, according to some students, it was to wake up the old drunk, the old drunk being Zoltan Zepeshi, uh, who was uh, the, then the president of Cranbrook Academy of Art and who was not uh, universally popular among the students. Uh, we are lucky for history's sake and for the Zepeshi family that the cannon did not fire. There was a bunny. Uh, but you can see that this is Zoltan Zepeshi's name. And if we keep moving up, we also see Zoltan Zepeshi's nose here. He was a Hungarian who was known for um, his large nose. He was also known for some other uh, less savory details that I won't say on camera on an official Cranbrook platform, but there are all sorts of allegories about what Julia Schmidt thought about Cranbrook's leadership. Uh, and I suppose by the students signing and, and dating this piece, they also agreed to those opinions. Now, these metal bands are a little curious to me. They are additive, so they were put onto the cannon afterwards. And I'm not sure exactly who um, Dot Green was, but he must have been involved in 1970 in the completion of the whole arrangement. It also says Cranbrook Sculptors um, Forgery. So it has a sort of label of where it was made. Cranbrook Sculptors Forgery, 1966. Now, if we move down to the wheels, uh, my favorite joke on the piece is it does have this spoke that's coming out that's labeled as a spoke. And then perhaps some of you can uh, speculate with me as to what these other pieces are. Some of them almost look like auto industry fragments. Um, you'll notice it's highly irregular, very asymmetrical. And it's a little hard to see on this side in the shadow, uh, but there is a sort of really rich layer of detail. So you'll see here like this little face that begins to pop up. So you'll have to come by in the morning and the afternoon to really get a good look at all of these crazy details that are put into the piece. Now, as we come across to the other wheel, you'll see why it was on display or why it was taken off display in August of 2016 and just put back this morning. Uh, the wheel actually broke. So it was on a much, much smaller concrete pad and it actually slipped off of the pad and was hit repeatedly by lawnmowers. Uh, and so the wheel was uh, had to be repaired. And so you'll see that the repair is now here with this beautiful brazing. This wheel is a little bit more elaborate than the other wheel and we see again this sort of highly irregular asymmetric design. I love down here this arrow that points in the direction of the cannon rolling and it says zap. Then there's also these funny little moments where they almost look like Egyptian hieroglyphs um, of sort of I don't know what these figures are perhaps one of you recognize them with their beaks uh, leading up to some sort of table or, or, oh no, it's leading up to a cannon. Yes, so they're, they're actually, it's a meta cannon on a cannon uh, leading to these other sort of Egyptian figures. Now, you'll see that it, this is actually coming off of a scroll. I was telling my colleagues as we were looking at this earlier, um, you know, <laughs> I really want to make a guide to this piece because every time I look at it, I see something new and it really deserves that old sort of architecture school or art history school technique where you bring your sketchbook out and you have to draw the item because it's only through drawing with a pencil line uh, do you begin to notice all of the little details as you capture them through your mind with your hand. Now, as we move up the wheel, we're seeing other figures that I've yet to decipher, perhaps some grapes, perhaps some crabs. I don't know, are we into sort of underwater theme here? Uh, it's, it's interesting that the little Egyptian moment doesn't appear anywhere else, uh, sort of a bit like this spike here. That is also another sort of singular moment where the wheel becomes aggressive. Uh, the sort of hand of the sculpture that's revealing the sort of process of iron casting, which it does start with clay, then it goes to a plaster cast, and then a different plaster cast, and then it goes into the Cranbrook Forge. And then a little baby, 
down here um, who is next to the sort of ta palm frond and the zap and some other sort of anguish, almost looks like a frog here. And if you're familiar with Julia Schmidt's work, this sort of, I, the roughness of it all, the texture, it's very important to his work to really show all of these um, sort of imperfections. So this frog may, I mean, he may have lost his nose here on uh, campus sitting out for the past uh, 60 years, but he also may have lost that as part of the process of going from clay to plaster. And for Schmidt, um, he was working in the style that really celebrated the imperfection of making. I mean, this is someone who builds a forge at Cranbrook, the first building since Aliel Sarnan died in 1950, specifically so that he can make cast iron sculpture. Uh, because he does not want to do plasters and send them off like Carl Millis does. He wants to do plasters and cast them here. Now, there are some other little pieces like Blam 1966. And then I demonstrated how the clacker clacks already. Uh, but here she is. And she is, uh, again, this weird material choice where it's an iron cannon and then a bronze clacker. And she's sort of closing her ears because, of course, that very brutal noise. Uh, and then there is, here we're seeing a bit of the, uh, uh, the, the danger of a ferrous metal, an iron-based metal, is that it is going to rust. And so uh, we were discussing among the registrars today, you know, is this bolt going to cause further damage? Because you have a metal here that is probably a, a type of mild steel, then you have a bronze here, and then you have iron here, and these metals really do not like being so close to each other out in the water. And that is what has happened with our seized axles, is that the combination of metals and the combination of iron have created it where it no longer rolls. It's a pretty wild piece. Um, it is a pretty cool. I mean, it, it looks amazing out here um, in the sun, celebrating its return to campus to defend Cranbrook Academy of Art from all who may wish her harm. Uh, as I mentioned, it was fired in 66. It was fired again out of the sculpture department. Uh, it misfired down Academy Way. And the last time that it was fired was 1993, uh, when George Booth announced that we would be invading uh, in, in the Middle East and starting the Gulf War. A Cranbrook student took the cannon out, took a 1950s um, American-made, Detroit-made Chevy, put a tank of pig blood on top of the Chevy and then successfully fired the cannon at the old Chevy, burst the pit tank of pig blood and the pig blood completely covered the car. Um, so it was a nice little uh, anti-war moment there in 1993. Julius Schmidt himself, as I mentioned, was relieved of his teaching duties in 1968. He began teaching at the University of Iowa in 1970, and he taught there until he retired in 1993. He is considered to be the father of iron sculpture, uh, and he his own studies at Cranbrook for four years in the 50s, and then also with Osip Zadkin in Paris, who was a Russian-born um, Cubist sculpture, as well as studying in Florence, really give him this wonderful transitional position between abstract and non-representational sculpture and the sort of uh, Cubist tradition and representational uh, tradition. I think the canon is a great embodiment of its moment in time. It, it reflects the angst of the 1960s, both at Cranbrook and around the world. It reflects extraordinarily specific angst and specific opinions about specific people, but it does it in a very abstract and artistic way. I'm pretty proud of having it back on campus today, and I'm excited that we have been able to restore the wheel. Perhaps in a future date, we'll restore the axle so it can again move around. If you want to see the canon in person and you want to learn more about the history of Cranbrook and Academy of Art, I do want to invite you to the newest exhibition at the Academy. It is a monumental four-year project that is coming to a fru fruition uh, on this Friday when With Eyes Opened uh, open 
opens at Cranbrook Art Museum. It's a survey of over 250 graduates with 275 works of art. It is not the Cranbrook story, but it's the start of telling a much expanded Cranbrook story. It brings together people like Julia Schmidt, but other people like Indian weaver Nellie Sethna, uh, who the Cranbrook archives will celebrate on Tuesday with a lecture at one o'clock. It also brings together um, people who really have been sort of, if not forgotten, not as well celebrated. So I really encourage all of you to check out the book. It's selling out fast. Uh, it's published or written by Andrew Blauvelt with many different assistants, including Cranbrook's archivist, past and present, and including many other uh, uh, hands and scholars, myself included. So make sure you check out the book with eyes opened. And before the fall, when it closes, you've got to get here to Cranbrook Art Museum to see the canon and see what is really an extraordinary show. I know that they are still inside the museum right now, working on the exhibition, installing like crazy. 275 objects is a lot to put on display. And so John Geiger, our preparator and his team are working uh, full throttle, full steam ahead for the rest of this week until the Friday opening. I look forward to uh, seeing you at the exhibit sometime. There's going to be a closing reception uh, that will be a much fun in September. In the meantime, you can always follow Cranbrook Art Museum on its social media. You can follow Cranbrook Academy of Art on its. And you, of course, make sure that you follow us here at the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. My job as curator of the center is to help tell the whole Cranbrook story, including these stories of the art museum, and alongside all of my coworkers uh, at the different Cranbrook program areas. I hope you enjoyed this look at Julia Schmidt's magnum opus, uh, The Great Iron Cannon. A little bit later tonight, I will be posting some photos of the installation. If you're wondering how we moved this, it was a uh, mixture of brute force and a giant, um, uh, what do you call the excavator? And so we used an excavator with ropes and we tied the different components of the cannon to the excavator, lived in fear, spent a lot of time looking at my toes relative to these thousand pound pieces of iron and bronze, um, but with Cranbrook facilities, uh, and particularly the efforts of Steve, our mechanic down in the garage, who, how he got roped into it, I will never know. He didn't really know either, but I couldn't have done it without him uh, lifting these really very heavy, very seized, very unwilling to go back together pieces and creating the cannon as it is today. It's great to be back here with you on Instagram. Good to see all of you friends. Uh, if you've missed me on Instagram and you do have Facebook, I am on Facebook still every Friday live at five. I'll be trying to do a few more of these live at fives on Instagram, especially after you, my lovely fans and followers, were generous enough to elect me uh, Detroit's best social media star. Uh, and with the publication of that article on Friday, I wanted to make sure that I was here this Tuesday at five o'clock uh, in case any of you are here because of that article. So I'll leave you with another view of the canon. Um, it's pretty bonkers. It's pretty grotesque um, in a good way, in a sort of art historical way. It veers on the sublime, uh, veers on you know everything from the cubist sort of truck stop art. It has it all in just one little canon. And I did manage to position it so that it would not be uh, firing at students as they entered and exited the uh, uh, dormitory. But then earlier today, someone suggested that we need to get little cannonballs, like we're old St. Augustine or something. Uh, and I did like the idea. I did shine a flashlight down the barrel of the cannon. I'm not sure it's going to be fired again without a lot more work. So we'll resist. We're pretty pacifist here at Cranbrook. Thanks so much for joining. This has been another Live at Five tour with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. Until next time, I'm Kevin Atkinson. Make sure you check out With Eyes Opened, a new history of Cranbrook Academy of Art. It's an exhibition and a book. Goodbye, everyone.